about blood vessels. This is chapter 19 in your text. And there are different types of blood vessels. And at this point, you are familiar with an artery and a vein, right? And what do you know about an artery and a vein? Arteries away from the heart. No. All arteries carry blood away from the heart. The exception has to do with oxygenation. So all arteries carry blood away from the heart. All veins carry blood to the heart. And the one thing, the other descriptive that we think of concerning these two are oxygenation of blood. So if you think in terms of oxygenation of blood, you do need to recognize that there is an exception. And all arteries carry oxygenated blood except for pulmonary arteries. And all veins carry less oxygenated blood. Um, except for pulmonary veins. So that's important to recognize. Now here you can see on the slide, um, basically this is just showing you the system. Now this is all of the things we're going to talk about in a nutshell. So it's basically a diagram that halfway mimics the human body. But our heart here is basically a block. What you need to recogni recognize though is that there are different types of arteries to learn, and they have different jobs to do, and there's different types of veins um, to talk about, and they have different jobs to do, and then we have capillary beds, capillaries, and they have a different job to do also. Now, this is also something to think about. While you're learning these vessels, I want you to think about the types of tissues involved. So this takes us back to tissues, which was last semester, and this is that's the reason why you need to have had AMP1 before you have AMP2, because now if you don't remember all those tissues, it's difficult to learn the material, because I'm always going to ask you about, well, what kind of tissue is this? How do you know? You think about the function. All right? Um, when we get to, for example, when we get to capillary beds, what's the function here? Absorption and filtration. Right? Absorption, filtration. So that should automatically, what should automatically pop in your head? What type of tissue? Epithelial tissue. I heard squamous. But a, it's going to be epithelial tissue. Filtration and, uh, I'm sorry, secretion, absorption, filtration type mechanisms should all, always make you think of epithelial tissue. So here's the other thing to think about is that blood, um, pumping through the arteries, is, it's going to have to pump, right? The heart's pumping it, but as it goes through these arteries, these arteries are going to be highly muscular. What type of muscle are you going to find in arteries? Smooth muscle. It, it, you have to think of the three types and think about what's going on. It's an involuntary type muscle. It's got to be smooth. So all the arteries, and uh, arteries are going to be highly muscular because they got to pump blood to the rest of the body. Is it super important that the blood get back to the heart, the deoxygenated blood to get back super fast? Not as important as it is for the blood to get out to the tissues. So you're going to see some differences. So we're going to be comparing and contrast, contrasting arteries and veins. I want you to be able to do that. When we get to lab next week, our last lab before our practical, we'll have a model in which you'll be comparing the artery and the vein. You're going to want to be able to decipher between them and like what's going on with that. Why does this one have this, these um, structures involved and why does this one have these structures involved? So those are things to pay attention to. Now, so you can actually see, we're going to come out the heart, we're going to look at three different types of arteries. We're going to look at elastic arteries, also known as conducting arteries. We're going to look at those branches come out and all for those that are going to be muscular arteries, also known as distributing arteries, because why? They're distributing to the areas. And then we're going to have arterioles. Okay, and arterioles are always going to lead, are known as resistance, resistance vessels and they're leading into um, the capillary beds. Then coming out of the capillary beds, we're going to have venules. 
we're going to talk about what consists of the venules. We'll have small veins known as capacitance vessels, and we'll have large veins known as capacitance vessels. So we're going to talk about all of those um, different categories and why you find them where. What do blood vessels do? Well, we already know they're muscular, and we know that arteries are going to be more muscular than veins, right? So there's going to be an extra layer of muscle in an artery versus a vein. They pulsate, constrict, relax, and proliferate. Um, these systems are basically, you can think of them like pipes, delivery pipes, right? So delivering um, the blood to and from the heart. That's what they do. It's a system. Um, and it works very similar to any other system that, that delivers and has to, and, and is circular, right? So you think about different systems that work that way. Um, I'm thinking of sewer system kind of works that way, okay? It's a circular system. So water is a circular thing, okay? And all these conduits and pipes to deliver our water system is going gonna, gonna to be fairly similar. Arteries, as you already told me, carry blood away from the heart. And the smallest type being the arterial, and is all, arterial is always the one that feeds the capillary bed, as I just told you. Capillaries are the thinnest, and they're the site of gas exchange. They're the thinnest. They're only going to be a single layer of epithelial tissue. You're going to find all kinds of tish, different tissues in the arteries and veins, but we're going to have basically one thin layer of um, epithelial tissue for where the site of exchange. Then leading out of the capillary, we'll have venules. Those are the smallest veins draining those capillary beds. And veins carry blood to the heart. So we're, we're pretty much comfortable there. Now let's talk about the basic structure of a blood vessel. And when you go to lab, you'll have to describe this. And then you're going to have to tailor it towards an artery and a vein. But basically, we think of three layers surrounding a lumen. Does everybody know what a lumen is? So lumen is usually the empty space. Your intestines have a lumen, OK? So blood vessels all have a lumen. So that's the empty space. So that's the most internal or deep layer or deep area. And that lumen is surrounded by these three layers. The deepest layer, starting from the lumen, is going to be the tunica intima. That's going to be endothelial tissue, which is a form of epithelial, right? Uh, epithelial tissue. Why? This is going to be a point where things move in and out, right? So endothelium. The next layer, the middle layer, is going to be the tunica media. Typically, this is where you will find muscle in the tunica media. It is the middle layer. It's composed of circular, smooth muscle, usually allowing for constriction and dilation. So inner layer, you're thinking diffusion, movement, epithelial tissue. Middle layer, you're thinking muscle. And then the most External air, uh, layer is called the tunica externa, and it is composed of college, collagen fibers kind of loosely arranged. So it's more like, it's, what do we think of when we think of collagen fibers? Connective tissue, OK? So there's connective tissue. So identifying types of tissues when we go through organs and different systems, that's important. And it helps you remember what's going on in that system or what's happening. All right, so now this, is, this picture is very similar to the model that you're going to actually see in lab next week. And here's the artery on the left. Here you can see the lumen. Artery has um, elastic membranes. So there's going to be another, there's a, your first, first big difference, layering difference right there. What's the difference between an artery and a vein? Arteries are highly elastic vessels, and so they have elastic membranes. They also have a thicker tunica media. What does that tell you? They have a thicker tunica media. More muscle, OK? Because we said that's where the muscle is found. Arteries are much more muscular than veins, and they have to be. We've got to pump things pump fast, right? The, net, the, the last big difference is that arteries contain no valves. You're going to see that in the veins, we have these little valves ever so often to prevent backflow, right? Don't need that in arteries. We're pumping. Resistance is high, getting the blood to the tissues. We're not having to prevent backflow issues. But in the veins, that is the case. 
and you think about what you're fighting, think about arteries. Gravity works for arteries, right? So for the head, but the rest of our extremities is gravity's helping get the blood to those places. But what about when you got to pump blood all the way back from your big toe to your heart? That's going to be a little harder, right? So those valves prevent that backflow. So those are the major, major differences. So elastic membranes, muscular layer, and then valves. So those you're going to really pay attention to when we're talking about differences between arteries and veins. You can actually see, so let's, you know, looking at um, the two, looking at the arteries. So here's the lumen. Here's another thing to point out. Typically, like, if you're comparing apples to apples, so a similar vein to an artery, veins have larger lumens than arteries. So you can see that from this picture, right? And that has to do with resistance and pumping. So there's a larger lumen here than here. And it's very easy to see that in a microscope because, number one, you'll, when they're side by side, you'll see, oh, the, the lumen almost folds over on itself. Do you want the lumen to fold over on itself in an artery? No, we don't need any blocking in those arteries, right? That, that blood needs to flow, it needs to go where it needs to go. So. If we were looking at a microscope picture, and I think we actually, let's see if we have one in our, I don't have one in the notes, but there is one in your, in your book. <clears throat> but if you're looking in an actual picture um, of a microscope picture of the artery and the vein, you can see that the lumen is very different with the vein and the artery. Also, the artery walls are thicker. Why? Because of the muscle. The muscle is much thicker. So that tunica media is an obvious telltale um, sign that you've got an artery. See, look at the muscular layer here. So tunica media, very muscular. Y'all see that? How thick compared to this over here? Look at that. So you can see. Um, additionally, look at the elastic membranes. So you can see the elastic membranes. We've got one in the tunica intima here, one on the outside of the tunica media. So that will help you tell pretty quick, pretty easily. Now on the microscope, you typically can't see a valve. We don't see a valve typically, but you can see a valve here. And that's a big difference if you're actually looking at the model. Now look at the capillary bed. So you can see the arterioles leading into the capillary bed. And the color change shows you the gas exchange is occurring. And then you can see where it leads into the venules. Now look at that capillary, single layer so of endothelial cells. Why? Because of the function. We want things to drop off and pick up relatively quickly. Now let's talk about the differences between um, the different types of arteries. So the first one that we've talked about is an elastic artery. Um, basically, these are the thick walled arteries near the heart. They have low resistance. Um, they contain more elastin than other arteries, and they actually kind of exhibit a pumping motion. All right, so um, that's the elastic artery, base your aorta. Okay, very big. Those are the largest arteries. Um, and if you'll look back here, another term we use for those elastic arteries are conducting arteries. They're conducting the blood to where it needs to go. All right, the next arteries of interest are called the muscular arteries. And they branch off of these elastic or conducting arteries. And they're actually the, they're conduits. So we call them conducting arteries. They're, I'm sorry, they're conduits. They're, they're conduit arteries deliver, delivering the blood to the actual tissues. So. They, the, the conducting arteries are the first ones. These arteries distribute. Okay, So the conducting arteries are the main ones coming off. They're the biggest or the thickest. And then they're going to start to branch to where they can distribute to the tissues. So they deliver blood to the body and, the organ, and all the organs in the body. They have the thickest tunica medius. All right? So they're highly muscular. And they constrict and dilate to get to those, to those tissues. Now, if you think about it, they constrict and dilate depending on your tissue needs, right? Do you want them fully dilated to your digestive viscera when you're trying to run a couple of miles? 
No. So it, depending on what your body is doing and your nervous system right, recognizes that, right? So if you're in parasympathetic or sympathetic mode, if you'll recall from last semester, it's going to depend on whether those vessels are dilated or not dilated or constricted, depending on what's happening. So that muscle in those arteries can constrict and prevent so much blood going to that area. Do you need some blood? Yes. But to get those organs fully working, you're going to send a bunch of blood to them. So we want to refrain from sending lots of blood to the digestive viscera if we're in sympathetic mode. We want all that blood be, being going where? Where does that blood need to be going? Muscles, brain. Okay, so we, we need to be in fight or flight mode. Um, then you have the smallest ones, the arterioles. These have few elastic layers. They're not as elastic. These respond to hormonal and neural controls to constrict and dilate. And they can actually have control, control the flow to the capillary bed as a result of not needing the blood flow to go to the um, digestive viscera, like I was mentioning earlier. And then when you get to the capillary bed, those capillary beds can actually shut off. They, and we'll talk about that in a second. But they have little sphincters that can actually shut off, so you'll have just this one vein going through the bed, and it goes straight through the vein, to the veins. Now, veins have thinner walls than all the arteries, and that's because of that muscle layer, right? So not as much muscle. We talked about the large lumens. And they serve as blood reservoirs as a result of those valves. So those valves keep the backflow of blood and little reservoirs of blood pull up in between reservoir to reservoir to keep blood moving to the heart. And as a result of that, and they, these are a lot further from the pumping of the heart, they have low pressure. So the pressure in the veins are much lower than the pressure in the arteries. We have small and large capacitance veins, just depending on um, location. Then we have venules. Venules are composed of mainly endothelium with one to two small layers of smooth, smooth muscle. And remember, these co are coming off the capillary bed. So basically, what is blood flow? Blood flow is going to be the volume of blood flowing through a vessel. And this is important because it tells us about a vessel what's going on with that vessel or organ or the circulation. So we can tell things about the health of your vessels by the flow, the blood flow, right, through those vessels. So that would be diagnostic. Blood pressure is also diagnostic. Um, blood pressure is the force per unit area exerted on a vessel wall by the contained blood. We can take a blood pressure, and basically you're cutting off that blood flow and that's where you're getting those, remember the systolic and diastolic region, re, readings that we talked about re, briefly last chapter. We didn't go into a lot about diastole and systole, but these are values you get, and it's basically giving an indication of the health of your blood vessels in the heart. <clears throat> Systemic arterial blood pressure in the largest arteries near the heart is what you're actually testing when you test the blood pressure. Resistance. Resistance is the opposition to flow. And we've already discussed that some of these vessels have different resistance depending on where they are. And this is basically the measure of the amount of friction blood encounters as it passes through vessels. This can be affected by the blood viscosity. So what happens if you have too many red blood cells in your blood? It will be sludgy and highly viscous. It will be thick. And that's going to create more resistance in those blood vessels. So it's going to have a hard time pumping. This is one of the problems with blood doping, right? So if an if a athlete, does everybody know what blood doping is? Blood doping is where an athlete takes out a pint of their blood. And you know oxygen means energy, right? Because oxygen goes in, takes up electrons, you make more energy. Um, so these Athletes will often go train in a high altitude. What happens when you go to a high altitude? Your kidneys release a substance called erythropoietin, EPO. It's a hormone the kidneys release, and it stimulates your body to make more red blood cells. You make more red blood cells, so you have more red blood cells when you're on top of a mountain than you do at sea level, right? So if you're an athlete, you may go travel. You may travel to a mountainous area if you don't live in one, and train and pump up your red blood cell production, take out a pint of blood, keep it for later. Then you could go um, run in a 
event and put the blood back in your body, and then you have all this energy. That's what blood doping is. Um, I think it's kind of difficult to detect. I think they have to actually take, run some blood tests to, to see how much blood you have and this and that and the other. How many They count your red blood cells because you shouldn't have that many. Isn't that what Lance Armstrong was accused of doing? So that's what, what happens. And so it's very dangerous to an athlete because it can change the viscosity of the blood and make the blood where it can't pump. And they can die right there on the spot. I love it when anatomy and physiology helps your life. They're like, she's so smart. I need to hang out with her. That's exactly right. I like it when you can go spit out your anatomy and physiology that you learned to your coworkers and friends. Use it. But you know, that's what Lance Armstrong was doing. And blood doping is can very much so change this resistance, and then you've got major problems. The length of a vessel is also going to change the resistance. So the longer the vessel, the greater the resistance. So the, the length is going to make more resistance. And then the diameter contributes to um, resistance. So the smaller the diameter, the greater the resistance. So the aorta is actually going to have less resistance, right? But the longer it goes, the more resistance the blood is going to experience. And that's why you've got these distributing arteries and these arterioles that experience so much dilation and constriction, right? So we've got to be able to pump the blood. The blood's got to be able to keep going, and it's, it's fighting resistance. OK, systemic blood pressure. So the blood closest to the heart has the greatest pressure. It's coming right off of the heart. And if you take a blood pressure, you, you're going to get a systolic pressure and a diastolic pressure. And the systolic pressure is measured as the left ventricle contracts exp expanding blood into the aorta. If you take the blood pressure in the left arm versus the right arm, it's going to be different. Why is it going to be different, left arm versus right arm? All right, one's closer to the heart than the other one, so it's normal to have a different reading in one arm than the other. But typically, the systolic pressure is around 120. And typically, when we record these values, we get a systole value, and we record it over the diastole value. So it's around. And now, this right here is called millimeters of mercury. And so it's a pressure reading. We, we measure pressure typically in millimeters of mercury. You've hear, heard the barometric readings from your weatherman. When they're talking about a pressure system coming in, they usually say, you'll see either it's either going to be millimeters of mercury, which I think is more common, or an atmosphere. One atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, So typically dealing with the pressure, we go with atmospheres and millimeters of mercury. So here we are at 120 is around average. Your diastolic pressure is measured as the aortic semilunar valve closes and the ventricle relaxes. The aorta recoils to maintain enough pressure to push blood to the capillaries. This one's typically around 70 to 80. I actually think in females it can be a good bit lower. Mine's definitely lower than 70 most, on a normal day. Yes? Um, headache is, is more of a side effect. So like, it doesn't cause it to happen. But if your blood pressure goes up, it typically will cause you to have a headache. So, and stress can cause your blood pressure to go up, right? So if you had a stressful situation, your blood pressure may go up and it may cause a headache. Um, we can also get a pulse pressure. And this can be the throbbing pulsation. This is in, in a particular artery. You can feel that pulse pressure. You can feel with somebody's pulse, right, to see if blood flow is what it should be. Um, and that's occurring as blood forced, is forced into the elastic arteries during a ventricular contraction. Um, and you can see some different points. I kind of want you to get familiar with where you find these different arteries and veins that we're discussing. Um, the reason for that is because it helps you learn the human body a little bit better. So we've been in Chapter 1, we learned 
terminology, body parts, right? So learning these arteries uh, are going to help refresh you on your body parts and your regions and the things that we've already learned. Uh, for example, facial artery, we kind of know that one's going to be in the face. Common carotid artery on the neck. Um, brachial artery all right, in the arm. Radial artery makes us think of the radius. Radius connects to the thumb. Um, femoral artery, so we're thinking femur, so there's the femoral artery, artery kind of close to the groin. Popliteal artery. All right, behind the knee, remember popliteal, posterior tibial artery, and the dorsal pedis artery. So they're, that makes you think of the tibia and then the feet, right? So it kind of gives you an idea location-wise. That's pretty easy. All right, so here, what I want you to do before we meet again, I want you to spend some time learning these arteries. Just looking at them. It's not hard. It's not hard. It's just kind of looking at them. You're getting a feeling for these major arteries. You've got lots of um, blood vessels to think about, but really right here we're just looking at those major arteries coming off the body. If you go to Mastering AMP, you can play on a game. You can play this on a game, right? So go to my study area. I think I, do I have, have you all looked on the Blackboard and looked at the chapter contents? I think you can do all this on Blackboard too. So if you don't have the Mastering AMP account, um, for the traditional classes. It's actually required in my online classes, but if you guys don't have it, you can play on the chapter contents. So spend some time looking at some time looking at those arteries. And we will finish this PowerPoint on Wednesday. And you will have your test on Monday. On seven, chapter 17, 18, and 19.